Today, I want to talk about the difference between hormone therapy and glandular therapy, right? Another name for glandular therapy is uh, organotherapy, using organ extracts from animals, whether it's a sheep, pig, or cow. And this therapy was used in, in even hospitals in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I think up to like in the in the 30s, it was used. But then we started isolating the hormones in the gland tissue and then making them synthetic. And that's what we have now. You can get growth hormone, you can get thyroxine, which is T4 in the form of um, Synthroid. You can get estradiol, testosterone, insulin, cortisol, adrenaline. And so this is what our treatment for the endocrine system has become. You know, when someone has a hormonal imbalance or a hormonal deficiency, I always want to ask a question, why? Why are your hormones deficient in the first place? There are a lot of complications and side effects that occur when you start to do hormonal therapy. If we talk about the endocrine system and look at it from a very simplistic uh, viewpoint, you have the gland, you have the hormone, and you have the connection or receptor where it goes, right? And so what you're looking at is a very rudiment communication network. The gland is kind of like the thing that makes the hormone. The hormone is the communication. This hormone communication travels through the blood and it gets received by a receptor on the other end. And so it's the receptor that activates certain functions through genes and certain proteins. And when that activation occurs, there's also something else that's very, very important in this communication mechanism. And it's the feedback loop that's connected with this communication. In other words, it's a control mechanism that's controlled by the receptor. Uh, something is sent back to that gland to turn it off if we're dealing with a, a negative feedback loop. It's very similar to in your house, you have a thermostat that adjusts to a certain temperature and then it turns off at that temperature. The same exact thing happens with the endocrine system. And so when someone does hormonal therapy and they're giving you a hormone, um, the question is how do you uh, adjust for this feedback loop? How do you know how much exactly to give the person and when to give the person. Hormones are created and sent through a very complex wave pattern, a circadian rhythm. And uh, a lot of these hormones, especially the anabolic ones that actually build things up, are produced and sent uh, mostly in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, right? So when you take this hormone in the day, does that uh, complicate things? And so we're trying to mimic this very complex machinery when we actually take a hormone. And especially because the hormone we're taking is usually not a natural hormone. It's a synthesized isolate of that hormone. And there are many side effects, which I'm going to go through. The first thing you need to know is when you take these hormones as a hormone therapy, you actually inactivate the gland that produces that hormone. So you basically put that gland to sleep because you're bypassing the whole mechanism and you can cause atrophy of that gland as in one of the side effects from testosterone therapy, right? You actually cause testicular atrophy, or even when you take Synthroid T4, you actually cause atrophy of that gland. So now your body is dependent on that external supply. You should just be aware of that. I'm not telling you not to do it, but you should just know that going into this therapy. Like let's take growth hormone. Are there any complications? Uh, yeah, big time. Carpal tunnel syndrome insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, edema, increased breast tissue, increased risk of cancer. Now, what about when you're taking thyroid hormones? Well, um, insomnia, headache, tremor, chest pain, increased pulse rate, fatigue, and heat intolerance. And then what about estradiol, like estrogen? Well, there's a lot of bad effects that occur from that hormone. One is breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, stroke, blood clots, gallstones. But other than that, you can be perfectly fine. Now with testosterone therapy, um, it doesn't come without problems too. Acne, testicular atrophy, aggression, deeper voice, hoarseness, mood swings, insomnia, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what about insulin therapy? Is there any complications? Uh, yeah, I think the majority of the population right now is doing an experiment with insulin therapy. Of course, it's through eating a lot of refined carbs, but when you actually take insulin, it doesn't come without side effects. Number one, you're gonna get weight gain. 
mood issues, low potassium, swelling, heart problems, heart failure even. And if someone takes too much, they can end up in a coma. In fact, that was one of the therapies early on in the 1900s, giving people insulin shock therapy, where they give them insulin, put them in a coma, and they wake up greatly overweight. But apparently that was used for all sorts of um, mental problems. Well, but right now they don't do that. They use um, electric shock therapy, which is definitely a lot worse. All right. What about the adrenal hormones, right? Is there any problems with taking cortisol in the form of uh, prednisone, which is a synthetic uh, type of cortisol? Well, I'm a perfect example of that I had to take um, steroid shots every year for probably, I don't know, 12, maybe 15 years because of poison ivy. Uh, now I'm resistant to it. It created a lot of problems for me. It created insomnia, all sorts of adrenal issues. But the side effects from cortisol are diabetes, a very lowered immune system, cortisol resistance, which means now it doesn't really work. Just the same thing with insulin. You can get insulin resistance too, and now it doesn't work anymore. And so when you have cortisol resistance or even insulin resistance, you get now a deficiency of that hormone. So if you don't have enough cortisol, okay, um, you'll get a lot of inflammatory conditions, a lot of skin problems. This is why um, one of the common treatments for dermatitis and skin problems is steroid creams. But other symptoms would be insomnia, that was me, mood problems, agitation, and anxiety. So as you can see, there's a lot of side effects from this hormonal therapy, okay? Um, a much better strategy, which I would recommend, would be uh, using glandular therapy, right? Using glandular extracts. Now, what would that do that's different than hormonal therapy? Well, you're supporting uh, the entire endocrine system as a whole. When you take a glandular, you're getting a lot of things in that gland. You're getting nutrition. I mean, just take a look at glands as far as out of all the foods that people eat. And, you know, people are focused on eating muscle meat and things like that. But what about the rest of the animal, right? We used to eat glands early on. And uh, out of all the things that you can eat, your glands and organ meats are the most nutrient dense. So number one, we're going to support the endocrine system with a super nutrient dense substance. But you also have other things. You have growth factors, you have um, proteins, certain amino acids, peptides, which are chains of amino acids, cofactors, minerals, enzymes. You have the whole package, especially if it's freeze-dried uh, glandulars. Now, I think the big reason why we don't use glandulars anymore is because uh, apparently it's not practical. That's kind of expensive. Um, if you can take a look at what it would take to synthesize a hormone, you can do it at a much higher scale, you can refine it, you can synthesize it. But the question is, is it a better treatment? Well, you judge. But there's a lot of history on glandulars. For example, in 1891, there was a doctor named uh, Dr. George Murray, and he demonstrated that myxedema in uh, hypothyroid cases, myxedema is that kind of that puffiness that you would get that looks like fat, that it's not really fat. It's kind of a, a waste product from metabolism. Well, this doctor demonstrated that by taking thyroid extract from a sheep, he can resolve that problem. Other doctors were using extracts of the parathyroid gland in treating tetany or um, muscle problems after someone had surgery. Now, tetany is that twitching. The parathyroid regulates calcium. So somehow uh, taking the parathyroid gland helped that. I know when, when I was in practice, I used um, whole desiccated adrenal a lot. So I would use the adrenal gland for all sorts of things related to the adrenal. And I would see quite good results. But of course, you're not going to probably see a lot of money invested into doing double-blinded placebo-controlled clinical trials on glandulars because um, you can't really patent them. But you can still get like um, armor thyroid, okay? That's using the whole gland instead of just one hormone. People lose more weight on armor than just synthroid. Uh, one study, it showed that they lost an additional three pounds of weight when they took armor versus synthroid, there was also additional benefits of just feeling uh, a much uh, better sense of well-being uh, when taking armor versus synthroid. When you take the whole gland as a unit, you're getting a very complex, it's like a whole food vitamin versus some isolated vitamin. But anyway, I wanted to introduce you to yet another possibility. If you're uh, suffering with certain type of endocrine problems, there are glandulars that you could take that potentially could help you.
And unfortunately, when you're trying to find answers in other viewpoints other than traditional medical care, it's difficult. But sometimes you just have to understand, for example, like growth hormone, what gland produces that? That's the pituitary. Uh, what other uh, hormones are made by the pituitary that you could support? Um, so you're not necessarily taking a specific hormone. You can just take the glandular extract to support the whole thing. You can even get like the hypothalamus as an extract. And since we're on the topic, that's not necessarily uh, glandular tissue, but there's also other uh, organs and tissues that can benefit you. For example, like liver, there's probably no other nutrient dense organ than the liver with uh, iron and B12 and uh, vitamin A, but you also have spleen that can help the immune system and the thymus gland, which is a gland, but that would be something to take uh, for the immune system. And then you even have something like the trachea tissue, right? Which is apparently really good for joint issues or connective tissue or cartilage. I've seen some good results myself. Now, since we're on the topic of the endocrine system, I think the next thing to watch would be my video on what to eat to support your endocrine system. I put that right here. Check it out.